Hello everyone, welcome back. And if you are joining us now, welcome to day five of Premi Power Week. I'm Fabiana Bakin, Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, CPBF, and your host for this event. The Premi Power Week is the second of two international live series that CPBF is hosting 2020 in recognition of World Prematurity Day. These educational sessions are in collaboration with the International Family Integrated Care Committee, the Canadian Association of Neonatal Nurses, EFCNI, and GLANCE, the Global Alliance for the Newborn Care. For those not familiar with CPBF, we are a charitable organization, and our mission is to support and educate Canadian families of premature babies every step of the way. We believe that through consistent information, access to helpful resources, and peer support inside and outside the NICU, we can empower families ensuring they are ready to care for their baby. Consistent information is especially important today when we are facing a global pandemic. With educational sessions like this, we intend to bring you the guidance of healthcare professionals and the knowledge gathered by researchers around the world. These are valuable tools to help our community raise awareness and advocate for the well-being of families and their babies. I would like to thank AVI for the unrestricted educational grant and Pampers for supporting the Premi Power Week. And right now we're going to talk about the future of neonatology. It's our last session of the Premi Power Week and I'm very excited to know what is ahead of us. And joining me here from Edmonton is Dr. Shuli, who is a neonatologist and health economist, professor of pediatrics, obstetrics and gynecology and public health. Dr. Shuli had many roles throughout his career, and he's still a clinical senior clinician scientist in the Lunefeld Tannenbaum Research Institute. Dr. Lee received his medical degree from the University of Singapore, completed his pediatric training at the Genway Children's Hospital in Newfoundland, and neonatal fellowship training at Boston's Children's Hospital, and received his PhD in health policy economics from Harvard University. Dr. Shuli uh, research focuses on improving quality of care, patient outcomes, and healthcare services delivery. He developed family integrated care model as a paradigm of care in the new native intensive care unit. Dr. Shuli, thank you so much for joining us here today. Dr. Shuli, can you hear us? I don't hear you. Hello. Oh, now we can hear you. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Shuli. We can hear you if you can hear us. Hello, Dr. Shu. Okay, I think we experienced some technical difficulties. Dr. Shuli is gonna establish his connection. Oh, there he is. Can you hear us, Dr. Shuli? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> you just sit down for a minute and uh, good, good. I'm glad we are back. Well, first yeah. of all, thank you. And I want to congratulate Fabiana and the foundation for an amazing job that they have done over the years and also for this conference, which is really power packed and you can see the progress that has been made uh, over the years. So this is wonderful. And I'm pleased to see that it will provide a strong foundation for the future. So Fabiana asked me to talk about the future of neonatology, what it might look like. And so here are some thoughts that I have, and I'm gonna share them with you so that you can also think about what perhaps you can do <clears throat> to move neonatology forward in the near future. I think one of the most exciting and important things that uh, we have uh, seen in neonatology in recent years is actually the greater involvement of the family. And with FICARE, we suddenly brought in the family as partners in care as opposed to visitors in the NICU. And that's a very big step forward. But it's only the start. There's a long way to go ahead. If you think about it, not all our NICUs are actually functioning, even in FICARE, at the level that we want them to function at. In other words, we want to make sure that it actually is working well and parents are involved as intimate providers of care, as partners with the NICU team. 
And they really should be an integral part of the NICU team. And that really hasn't happened in all the units yet. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Secondly, we have to think about how do we make sure that the physical structures that we have are most conducive to this form of care. I'm not convinced that the single family room, the design that we have now, actually is still the right design. In other words, there are still, there's still work to be done. And we have to start thinking about how, we, if the families are going to spend more time in the NICU, how we can make it more functional, more comfortable, and better for them so that they can actually do what they are meant to do in the NICU. In the same way, we have to think about how we can involve them in the way we manage the NICU and not just in the care of the babies. Because if they are going to be part of the team, surely they can contribute to how the unit is run, is managed and organized. And so I would very much like to see parents become more involved, even at the administrative level and in the planning levels of all the NICUs. And I think this is something that parents can contribute a great deal to. And the running of the place is not just in the operations, but also in how each person's roles should evolve over time as we, as we begin to learn more about what we can do best from each of member of the team that's looking after the baby. <clears throat> now, the next thing we have to consider is a gentler, kindler approach. The whole point of bringing the family in is not only to provide the increased bonding between the families and the babies and improve care and improve outcomes, but it's also to ensure that we change our approach to neonatal care from one that is very medically oriented and very technology based to one that has like a kinder, gentler face. And also the, the way in which we approach the baby, the illness, the treatments and so on, starting with feeding. For example, in recent years, we have been emphasizing a great deal on human milk feeding. Now that's very important. Now, how do we ensure that babies are fed in the best way possible using milk rather than intravenous nutrition and so on? Now, that's not to say it's not necessary, but how do we optimize human milk feeding? I think there's still work to be done there. We can probably do fewer tests in the NICU. We can make investigations less invasive. And all these things will help us not just look at how do we uh, bring parents into the NICU, but how do we approach our babies in terms of medical care, nursing care, and so on, with less invasive procedures so that we can actually provide the babies with a gentler environment and a safer environment in which they do not require as many invasive tests and painful procedures and so on. Now, the third point I want to make is that technology has also advanced. And now we have many point of care technologies where we can do ultrasounds at the bedside, for example, instead of chest x-rays. We can do different kinds of procedures from ultrasounds of the heart and, and so on. And many of these technologies can supplant all the invasive kinds of investigations that we did in the past. And so we have to adopt more of these technologies, learn how to use them better. And also this will help to augment the kind of gentle approach that I was talking about. We should also have a seamless transition from the NICU to home, far more seamless than we have. Now, FICARE has gone a great deal to do that. By bringing the parents in, we can begin to prepare the families better for how to look after their babies when their babies go home. But there's a lot more to be done. <clears throat> for example, when the babies go home, we now have the Five Care Home uh, pros, uh, project that's going on under Dr. Jennifer Young, where we're beginning to look at how can parents support each other <clears throat> and support their babies better at home? And then we have to think about how do we integrate that with the services that we have in the communities so that in fact, this is seamless as opposed to uh, siloed and separate in different aspects of the care. This would mean that our follow-up units will need to reorientate themselves from just doing assessments to look, looking at early interventions. And these early interventions should probably focus more on behavioral and learning rather than emphasizing mainly on the physical and the cognitive developments, because those who have been putting a lot of efforts into 
<clears throat> but we haven't done nearly the same in behavioral and learning uh, emphasis. And this is actually very important because a great deal of the problems that we see in these babies can actually be headed off if we apply the right kind of um, behavioral and learning modifications uh, to the babies so that we head off a problem early and don't let it become a problem because these are many of the preventive things that we can do and see. In the same way, many of the school systems are actually unprepared for premature babies. They deal with all handicapped children the same way, and they think about premature babies as handicapped. Well, that's not always the case. <clears throat> there may be some premature babies who are handicapped, but many premature babies are just a little slow compared to their term counterparts. And therefore, we cannot treat them the same way. And increasing the school system's understanding of and how to deal with premature babies is a very important issue. It is something that we have a lot of work to do on. And it cannot be done through the Ministry of Health alone. This is something that we have to work with the education ministry, with the educational uh, personnel, so that they begin to understand our babies better. And they know how to, to help our babies uh, develop to the best of their capacity. And, you know, when I speak to parents, many parents tell me how difficult a time it is they have when the children start going to school, that they have to fight so hard to get the right services for their babies. And that precisely speaks to what this problem is. And I think that a group of parents and professionals working together to try and change this will be very important for the future. Now, neonatology is also going to be incorporating many sorts of new developments in medicine in the future. We are already starting to see, for example, the advent of fetal surgery and fetal therapy. For example, in babies with spina bifida, we no longer do the surgeries after the baby is born. And whenever possible, we try to do the surgeries before the baby is born. So when the baby is born, the uh, defect is already been dealt with. The wound is healed and the babies can begin to function well and much better than if the uh, surgery had to be done after the baby is born. In the same way, for premature babies, we're going to see many of these things happen. We are now into the, the era of not only fetal surgery, but very soon it will be gene therapy. It will be the application of genomics like CRISPR and so on. And these have all got tremendous potential, but also tremendous harm. And so we have to be very cognizant about how we embrace all these new technologies and how we can develop these further so that in fact our babies can benefit the best from them. And in this journey, I would advocate that parents need to play a equal if not leading role in how we embrace all these technologies so that we do it right and not embrace the technologies for the technology's sake, but ensure that it is for the best outcomes for our babies and our families. Now, in the process of doing this, what you're also seeing is that as treatments come earlier and earlier into gene therapy, into fetal therapy, and so on, the neonatologists and the obstetricians really need to be working more closely together. And I think that, in fact, the field of neonatal medicine and of obstetric medicine need to come closer together and potentially even merge to solve this problem better for our babies. And this is something that our professionals will have to have a great deal of foresight and a great deal of imagination to see how they can do this better. I think to just stick to the old ways of doing this where everything that happens in the womb is one thing and then after the baby is born, you hand the neology, that's probably going to be gone. We need to start thinking about the continuum of pregnancy from the time the baby is conceived or even before up to the time the baby is delivered and beyond as one continuous spectrum so that the care provided is not segmented but is in fact continuous. Now, when we think about that, we should also be thinking about how we evolve neonatology. In other words, neonatology right now is a subspecialty where in fact, neonatologists are trained first as pediatricians and then they subspecialize in the care of the newborn baby as neonatologists. In fact, we should probably change that so that neonatology is now a generalist uh, specialty. And the subspecialties need to be, the subspecialists uh, need to be specialists in particular areas of neonatal care, whether it's neurology or cardiology or gene therapy, etc., so that we can, in fact, develop people with the best expertise to look after our babies. 
So all these are huge changes to come. And these are just some of my own thoughts, but I'm sure that many other experts will have many other thoughts. And if we start to put our minds together to think about how we do all these things for the sake of our babies and how we can make them better and our families better and more comfortable, I think we will have a bright future ahead. So I'm going to stop there and uh, happy to answer any questions. Dr. Lee, thank you so much for joining us here today and to share your thoughts, how you're moving forward with neonatology. And I know you're a big advocate for families, families engagement, family integrated care. I'm actually, I feel like I'm a product of family integrated care, <laughs> that I'm doing the work that I do now because I was involved in the FICARE study in 2012. My son was at Sinai. So now you know what's happening with family engagement in the NICUs across Canada, uh, limitations of access to the units, and perhaps in um, many units still today in Canada, only one parent coming to the unit. So how do you see this family approach moving forward after the pandemic? Dr. Lee, can you hear me? I don't think his audio. I think our connection is not very stable, unfortunately. I'm sorry about that. Um, yes, I did hear your question. <clears throat> um, I think that, um, first of all, we need to ensure that all the NICUs embrace the concept of FICARE better. So the first thing we have to do is to set some standards about what FICARE actually means, because everybody says they're doing FICARE. But whether they are actually doing FICARE the way it should be done is open to question. And if you go around the different NICUs, you will see that they're done quite differently. So I think they have to uh, understand what they should be doing. And we probably need more interaction between the units so that some units can go to others where it's done better to see how it's done and say, ah, we can change that. And that should be not just the professionals visiting, but it probably should be parents going to another unit and saying, how is it that they are doing better than we are in this area? And how can we... Sorry, Dr. Shui, we lost you for a minute. Yeah, I don't think we lost Dr. Shuli. So I'm going to wrap it up here today. Um, I want to thank all of you uh, for joining this conversation today and to join this conversation the entire week of Premier Power Week. It was a very special week for us here at CPBF as well.